Dr. Bellini, Dean of the School of Architecture and Design, and I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone, and particularly to our distinguished guest, Jonathan Marvel, or Marvel, <laughs> from Puerto Rico, founding principal of Marvel Architects. We are extremely delighted to have you here today as our first guest speaker of our exciting fall semester lecture series. Thank you, Jonathan. What a wonderful start of our semester and academic year. My special thank you goes to the friends of the School of Architecture and Design. We are grateful for your generosity in sponsoring this event and for your sincere commitment to support our school and our students in multiple ways. Well, it has been a quite successful year for the School of Architecture and Design. We obtained, I'm very proud to announce, that we obtained eight years of full accreditation with six distinctions, the maximum that we could ever reach. Thank you. <laughs> experiences. I particularly enjoy supporting our lecture series, a sequence of presentations that bring fresh, innovative thinking on a variety of topics, inspiring and motivating our community. And please join me in welcoming our lecture series and exhibition coordinator, Associate Professor Naomi Frangos. She will share with us a few more details very shortly and briefly on upcoming lectures and exhibitions and events. Thank you. I'm going to use the mic. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Dean Maria Pervolini, for that wonderful introduction. I welcome you all to this evening for our opening lecture of 2017 fall series. Um, you must have all received our new poster for this semester, and I'm just going to go briefly through the lineup so that I can inspire you to continue to come out to our events. Um, on October 11th, our distinguished professor, John Michael Schwerding, will speak on his new book. Um, about Rome, Rome Urban Formation, and a lot of you go on these uh, travel abroads to Italy, so you will much, much appreciate this lecture that's happening in Manhattan um, on West 61st Street on the 11th floor. Um, then you will have um, the ARC October events. Um, we have a very special event planned at the AIA Center for Architecture at LaGuardia Place happening between October 16th and October 22. And during that time, we'll be, promote, be promoting and exhibiting work from our interior design program, which is celebrating its large anniversary this year, as well as a very, very important exhibition by Franco Perini. And um, that is something not to be missed. Um, Perini and Sergio will speak in conversation at the auditorium on Broadway on October 20th. And then on, in November, on November 8th, we have Christophe Kampusch, who teaches the um, core design studio and runs Forward Slash um, at Columbia University. And he will be speaking on his new book called Detail Culture, a series of details from architectural projects that you all know that he redrew himself, um, not to be missed. And last but most, um, awaited for because it was canceled last last semester is our lecture by Peter Eisenman in conversation with Dean Pervolini and Associate Dean, oh sorry, 
Chair Matthew Ford. Um, um, and that's happening on um, November 29th at the auditorium on Broadway. So now I will pass the mic back to Dean Perbellini so she can continue the introductions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. So this introduction scene is very well done and there's a lot of planning, a lot of work behind that. And I would like to ask John Sorrenti, my friend John Sorrenti, the founder and president of the highly recognized firm JRS Architect, to join me on stage. Please, John, join me. Over the past 25 years, John, among other prestigious accomplishments, has held such position as the president of the New York State AIA and vice president of the National AIA. John was also the 2016 Chancellor of the AIA College of Fellows and will become a Fellow in the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada in 2018. Congratulations. Appointed Chair of the New York State Education Board of Architecture, is also Director of the National Board of NCAR and one of our executive friends, most importantly. <laughs> I leave the floor to John to introduce our distinguished guest, Jonathan Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. And I'm assuming that you can hear me without the microphone. Um, Okay. There's a couple here, I guess I can choose. Um, um, and I just would like to also commend the Dean on a great job she's done this past year. Thank I think you. that um, all, of school, them. But all of us. But you're the leader and, and I know you, you need your your uh, team, but you know you are the orchestrator. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very excited to be able to introduce our guest speaker this evening. I have had the privilege of not only knowing John for the past 25 years, uh, or more, uh, but I've known his mother and father as well. His father was a colleague and a distinguished architect and a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. His mother, planner, and our horrible uh, was Buck Minister Fuller. Both of his parents are extraordinary people and um, just really, really wonderful um, architects and just incredible people. So with his heritage, Jonathan could not be anything else but the wonderful architect that he is. Born in Puerto Rico, Jonathan Marvel is an architect and urban designer with over 30 years of experience providing architectural planning, community economics development, and sustainability development of public spaces, educational institutions, and single multifamily housing, library, museums, large scale mixed use projects and developments. With offices in New York City and San Juan, Jonathan Foundry, Principal, Marvel Architect, teaches at Pratt Institute Graduate School of Planning and Placemaking, and has taught as an adjunct professor at Harvard, Parsons, Rice University, Washington University, and Syracuse. Jonathan is a recipient of the National AIA Design Award, co-chair of the New York AIA Planning and Urban Design Committee. He sits on the board of the Book Minister Fuller Institute, the Van Allen Institute, and Paula Color. Jonathan is also the founder of Truck Product Architecture, Rock 12 Security Architecture, and is a citizen designer and participatory uh, planning Nonprofit organization. With that, I give you Jonathan Mark. Thank, thank you, John, and thank you. Can everybody hear me if I speak with a mic? Yep. Um, thank you, Dean Perbellini. Thank you, Naomi. Um, this is an honor to be here. Um, it's it's an honor to be an architect and to be able to teach and and and. And to do what I do, I, I, it's, a, it's a great profession. It's a noble profession, and we we get to we have the luxury of thinking comprehensively. We're trained in 
and, and all sorts of different backgrounds and disciplines, and, and I, I believe that the practice that I've been leading in New York City and, and San Juan really is a collaborative, interdisciplinary practice. I happen to be the, the big cheerleader, but it's a, it's a team. We're, we're, we operate as a team. Everybody has an equal voice, whether you're a junior designer or you're a, a, a partner and director. And the, I, I, I can't tell you enough about how it's, it's important to start with the big picture. So you've got a big picture slide here at Superstorm Sandy, October 29, 2012. I was in Brooklyn at that night, um, and I think about uh, as, as the hurricanes come through the Caribbean and hit coastal Florida, Texas, we, it, often up here, we, we're, we're always kind of in adjusting ourselves with, with this idea of how does nature operate and how can we operate successfully in balance with nature and with this, the theme of the lecture is really about renewal and recycle and Naomi and I had a chance to talk about this theme. So I picked, I picked an introduction about uh, how to get, approach the theme of renewal and recycling within the architectural practice by talking about some, some broad work that we did in projecting what New York City might be like 100 years from now. Um, cities, the regeneration within nature, things decay, things get reborn and, and renewed all the time in forests and and we derive a lot of inspiration from that, and, I, and, and I, I was thinking this would be the perfect introduction to this, to this theme of, of, of restoration and renewal and, and reusing our buildings. So if you think how a forest works, it, it, it is like a um, like city in many ways. You start with a simple, kind of an in, isolate the individual, element and like you can an individual building within a city. And if that building operates self-sufficiently, uh, in an extreme case off the grid, you know, so can the entire neighborhood if you have all these individual things. So if you think of the city as a forest, how successfully forests get to maintain and replenish themselves, this is how our cities work. And if you study New York City, for example, you have the, the, the harbor, the water, the Erie Canal, the infrastructure that allowed this city to be the great city that, is it, that it is, the waterfront has slowly transformed over time to be less of a productive waterfront in terms of the warehouses and the shipping and, the, and all that to something much more akin to, um, to kind of a, a, a recreational, perhaps, and, and the transformation to ocean liners and museums along the waterfront um, I think was something that we looked at saying, what if the waterfront could be seen as a piece of infrastructure that could actually help the city operate on that recycle renewal capacity to, to, to be less dependent on fossil fuels and more on its own. So if you green up the city streets and sidewalks and you allow that whole element in a radical way to say, it's not about the cars and it's really about the people and, if the, and people have very fundamental needs. You look at this beautiful garden around you. We're, we're also happy when we're in balance with nature. This romantic idea, um, I think, w would be kind of fun if you if you were to. And how often do we get to think about that a hundred years from now? Um, we took the luxury to do so, and 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 in, in looking at four projects that specifically take on the, the reuse and the recycle motif, I thought I would show those to you. But because I really enjoy teaching and talking to students, I thought I'd give the students in the room a kind of my own trajectory, which is nothing unusual, although it, you know, the bar was raised high by the by the by a architect parent and a planner. But the idea that in you know over the course of 30 years, what the the the, the firms that I've been able to work with and the city as it gets transformed has been a, just an amazing opportunity not just for me, but for all of us. And so how to, how to start to see this kind of evolution of one's thinking, and I studied with Peter Eisman, you're gonna, you're gonna hear from Peter later this fall, he's an amazing teacher, definitely my favorite, but it's not, it's the people and it's the place. So having practiced in New York for 30 years, and I, 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 I am very much influenced by the place and by the, by the idea of the ecology of the city. And, and if you think about 
the different kinds of buildings that an architect gets to work on, so community buildings, um, schools and auditoriums, parks and public spaces, and urban design, larger scale, these are, all of them start to inform each other in an interdisciplinary way. And I, I'm going to pick four of those um, projects starting with the upper left and moving around um, in kind of a succession of how they evolve. So it's, it's, it's a, a selection. These are just projects that have just been finished uh, and they're kind of in sequential order of having been finished. Um, the, starting with the, the, the uh, new headquarters, world headquarters for the American Physical Society, they're the largest publishers of physics papers. Their site is not far from here. It's in the Pine Barrens. It's near Stony Brook and it's it's got a, so sort of the bottom, uh, in, in the middle of the Pine Barrens. I think that's an important theme because here you have a typical office space where they have their, um, this is pre-computers, so cubicles and and exchanging information by folders and with paper, um, and so transforming the building, they, they needed to double in size without moving to another location. Um, we, we wanted to think about also about how the building participates in, in its environment so that the parking lot has to get bigger. We wanted to simplify the entryway, uh, but you can see the footprint of the building's not changing. We're simply adding a, another story and we're moving the circulation around. We, we, we typically work in three in three good options are on the table every different every stage of the design process. So in a kind of early early concept design where you put the the circulation and the and the and the, the kind of the core of the of the of the building becomes the more, most important decision. And so you can see in this kind of old on the left, new on the right circulation diagram, we're really bringing people into the space, right, instead of from three different places, one place into a hub and then from there to disperse around and work much more efficiently. And, and, and marking that hub with an outdoor patio garden right in the middle, so coming down that circulation spine, getting natural light, spinning around the plaza here to go upstairs and around. Um, and, and so the the, the, the idea of exploring design with different kinds of diagrams, different kinds of language to show and talk about that story in the most simple way. So this diagram is, is simply there. To, the blue is the circulation. You come in that front door, occupy the, the, the plaza. You've got food and beverage around you. And then you come upstairs where there's another um, terrace with the, with the cafeteria. So modeling this physically, um, the most important thing is that stair to get you up and down, um, and then how to how to deal with the exterior to to really speak of the transformation. This is the, uh, a rendering of the kind of um, the low bar on the right gets reclad. The the double story new space is is a green wall. Um, entry is is simple but but effective. You don't need a lot to mark an entrance and. The, the, that inner courtyard, uh, which has an exterior space associated with, that, with the big stair, which is the view. And, and, and these renderings then become, the, play, become the, the way we see the building architecturally before it's built. And the photographs after construction are, are here to really support that. Um, as you can see, before the, the green wall takes over, we have a green screen on the double height space. We've marked the entrance with some graphics and some and, and of course surrounding the, the building. This is the, the view into that 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 inner inner plaza space with its accompanying garden um, and the walkways around it and the and, and mezzanines to offer food and beverage always important. The idea that that the structural components um, steel uh, which is quick and dirty uh, in terms of building in, inside of an existing space, uh, expressing that structural seal with, 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 its, with, the, with, the, with the, the channels and the, and, the, and, the, and the beams and that kind of that inner patio that we carved out becomes the hub that you walk around. Um, and then allowing the, the honesty of the connectivity of the, of the steel and the metal decking overhead. So 
we, we allow the structure and all the finishes to speak for themselves. We try to use very little paint and we try to use very few hung ceilings and things like that to, to really make the reading of the new and the old uh, come to life. And um, so this, this is that, that uh, uh, the view, sort of the pine barrens are, on, are to your left and behind you, you're looking at the building and, and the kind of the new version of this building it's twice as big, but it's occupying the same footprint but, and, and offering more vegetation uh, through its, the use of its facade and that inner patio. Here's a, a, another version of that idea about an inner patio and participating in, a, in, a, in an environment that's park-like. This is at the base of the Brooklyn Bridge on the Brooklyn waterfront. It's a, a theater called the St. Anne's Warehouse. And it's a it's a a place that is that's that's honored by being between the, the Manhattan Bridge to the right and the Brooklyn Bridge to the left. So you get this kind of really dramatic scaling device to be able to talk to as a and and the idea of, of renewal and recycle the the five story brick building is our site and uh, it, after the the. The Triangle Fire um, in, in at the turn of the century, that where the sprinklers and fire escapes were first introduced after that fire, um, you were you had to sprinkle your buildings. The if you didn't, if your five-story building, the owner elected not to sprinkle, so he took the top three floors off and it created a two-story building. It's on your right. Um, and St. Anne's Warehouse is a, a theatrical presenting company. Uh, they're on the left. They were in a, where, in a warehouse where they operated for 20 years and before moving into their new home. So we got to, to kind of take this existing building and, and reprogram it, retool it. It's now two stories. It was a, after they took the top three floors off, they, the roof fell in and it became a vacant shell. So the upper, the upper diagram is the, the shell as we found it. Um, and we started to say, how can we program that as a theater uh, for presenting international avant-garde theater productions? Um, and, and therefore, we have the roof end part of the building, and we wanted to keep another part open. So you can see we, we, we filled in the, the rectangular part, and we left a triangular part open to the sky, um, and, and left the warehouse portion that you see there is, is to, to keep it for full flexibility, uh, no part, as few partitions as possible, um, and leaving the triangle as a, as a, as a, as a really um, intimate garden and, and as the front, and the front door to, to the warehouse itself, to the, to the <coughs> So the, the, the ge this particular geometry, which is what, how we, which was the starting point, becomes the, 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 the thing that informed us the most, these beautiful brick walls and doing minimal intervention by putting all of the program uh, into this, this, this stripe right here that you can see uh, in all of these different theatrical configurations uh, that, that the, the, the support programs are in here and then all of the changes can happen in that outer area. And uh, here's a model. To, to sort of start the conversation going from a design point of view, how to, to, to historically be respectful of the brick walls and, and roof in that theater space at the same time. The most important design decision, of course, became how do you, in putting a roof at 21 feet above grade, which is where the ideal for theatrical production for the lighting and the catwalks, um, with a roof up, eight feet above the brick walls, what do you, what material can you put in between the roof and the existing walls to be, to be, to, to be a kind of a non-compete with the, with the historic fabric. So uh, you'll see where we ended up with that. Um, but this is the, the, going through the, again, the rendering process. How do we visualize the building for ourselves, for our clients, for the public community? Uh, these are all the renderings that we produce to really explore the language of the balancing of the new and the old. This is a view from the from the private garden towards the front door of the building with a big kind of signage overhead, where which which is where the mechanical units are. When you come inside, how to how to render steel and brick and 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 use the renderings as a tool to simplify the materiality and the language 
to keep the brick number one and prime, everything else becomes the supporting actor in that role. Um, no paint, so plywood, concrete, steel, all are in their natural state as materials to play against the natural brick walls that we kept alive and, and, and didn't even touch with any of the new steel that we inserted. So here are the existing photographs we, as we started the project. Here's the outdoor triangle underneath the Brooklyn Bridge. Here's how we started to sleeve the steel inside the rectangle itself. New footings, new new pilasters. None of them touch with brick walls. Everything's either a few inches away from the brick walls um, or in freestanding inside the space. But the brick walls, it, there's this wonderful word um, that you have to make everything revocable. You have to you have to be able to remove anything in a historic building and leave it as it as you found it. So you could you could remove and 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 and, and and the building would still be what it was before we touched it. You could the steel out. That's how. That's how de deferential we were to those to the existing bones of the building. So you can see the steel columns, the, the catwalk overhead, its mechanical sleeves uh, in, under construction, and then here are the finished images of the of the space, starting with the approach to the front door and the kind of the warehouse feeling evoking itself and the material corrugated siding above the above the brick in where the mechanicals are, the lobby space which acts as a cafe, acts as, an, as a small event space. You see the catwalks overhead even in this entry area. And and many of the walls were were in not such great condition, so we did have to repair those, but but we we were very careful about selecting which of the arch windows could be reused in a, in, in a kind of iconic way to, to frame the views of the Brooklyn Bridge, which is one of the great moments in New York City. So here's the, the vestibule that you walk into from the garden. You could look back and see that, that framed view of the bridge. And the, plywood, the long plywood wall that shrouds the, the mechanicals um, and, and ties everything together. The glass brick, which was that final just most of our design issue was what, how to fill in that, that area between the roof and the walls. And here's the mock-up with this corning glass brick. Um, so it's a locally sourced material, solid glass, no, 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 no air, no bubbles, and, and it's a masonry material. It acts like a brick, and it acts that it has that handcrafted feeling. You can see how it's being supported by the steel cantilevered shelves that, that hold it in place. Not, and floating on top of the, the historic buildings, a view back of the building from the, from the park. Um, the third project that, that is, I think, emblematic of this idea of recycling a, 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 a historic shell, this is in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, so it's a few, uh, it's about a mile away from, from the building you just saw. Brooklyn Navy Yard is a, is a kind of a world unto itself um, in the East River. And, and it's between the Manhattan Bridge and the Williamsburg Bridge. It's, it's, it's about 150 acres. It's, it has over 200 buildings in it, all historic in nature. This was the largest production of battleships starting with the Spanish-American War. Um, up until today, they're still working it as a shipyard, but not military anymore. It's now a kind of a, a hub for new industries and new, particularly new tech industries. And our client took on a um, 85,000 square foot warehouse shell and re-clad the shell, re-roofed it, re-windowed it, and then put inside uh, something that you'll see in a second. So here's the kind of the shell as we found it, all falling apart. The steel frame, however, being in place in this big kind of warehousey environment. Um, very inspiring, obviously, with the gantry cranes and all the exposed steel and and super. Uh, you know, indestructible. If this is a building that was built in you know over 80 years ago, um, and it's still strong. And and so our idea is really celebrating the public spaces within that. Um, so those are the orange areas, and 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 circulation being the most important thing um, to celebrate how you get from A to B. Putting in a mezzanine that floats above the big the big warehouse production floor and then allowing that mezzanine to grow in 
and fill up it, the rest of that space towards the edges of the building and still hanging on to sort of the, the meaningful nature of that big open space. So some, some of the floor, the floor plans are really there to show you the different sizes of, with a simple module of 400 square feet. We're able to create about a dozen different sizes that, that this place called New Lab can now rent out to, to young tech companies uh, not on a month-to-month -month basis, but offering them subsidized rent for a, a year at a time. So you can take a small module or up to 8,000 square feet. Um, so there's 52 tenants on three different levels, and you can see the different sizes of the, of the areas in which they can work, from the ground floor of the mezzanine to the third floor and the fourth floor. The section here shows you how we were, how we sleeved in the mezzanines to keep the space as open as possible. We even you know, we really spent a lot of time looking at the mechanical systems and how to distribute the air uh, into the different modules independently with their own VAV boxes, but, but always deferential to the steel, never hiding it, always, always celebrating it. And again, going through the exercise of rendering how this might start to, to look and feel with color, with, with the module itself being of, of transparent and flexible in nature, having a cafe in the middle of the space, having a lot of movable partitions. And so the final photographs support, I think, that kind of idea of the city in the city and how to make the different levels come alive with, with bridges and crosswalks and the module being a kind of a flexible area at, at the different levels with indoor and outdoor spaces all inside the, under the big roof. Um, Keeping the material choices simple, everything's black or concrete or white, and letting the furniture be the, the kind of the sprinkle of, and, and spice of the place, and always kind of interacting with the existing steel members, which are, which again are the the the, sort of the moment of truth is how 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 you want to be inspired by by history over time and playing new against old. Finally, uh, the fourth project is. A, a sister school to you in, in New Jersey. It's the New Jersey Institute of Technology's um, new tech center where they took 16 different departments and brought them under one roof in the, in, and took over in a, a historic building in Newark along Martin Luther King Boulevard. It's, it's this old high school called Central King High School and it was kind of up for grabs, NJIT bought it. Um, and you can see in its footprint of the the historic 1912 building, and then it had a 1969 edition of a gym and a pool. So here's the, the historic high school with its fabulous stair, uh, spilling down to Martin Luther King Boulevard, one of the main avenues in Newark, and all this you know fantastic kind of terracotta <coughs> and brick. And then here's the addition they put on the gym and the pool at, at its base, sort of taking away that monumental stair the building had suffered over time, like like all deferred maintenance will do to a to a masonry structure with steel behind it, the steel rust and starts to pop out the masonry. Lots of fabulous spaces inside that we wanted to capitalize on in bringing 16 different departments from the from a technology school together. How they can share some core places and move and circulate. So studying these different departments and looking at them. In a kind of an, as a as a in a natural or as a natural organism, how to bring them in, into into the existing building and its historic core, and then really the opportunity was what to do with the the gym and the pool. They really uh, were were not part of the historic fabric, but really could be playfully uh, reoccupied. Looking at all the different levels and and bringing a lot of flex space and, and into the different departments, seeing it kind of in section where the ground floor and lower levels become the public parts of the building, allowing the different departments to be upstairs, but really giving them representational opportunities in that public corridor so that if you want to visit NJIT as a visitor, you can get a snapshot of what's happening on campus just by visiting one building and walking through the lower levels and seeing what all the different departments are, are up to by giving them small 500 to 1,000 square foot labs in that, on the, on the lower levels with circulation taking you upstairs to go to your classes. And, and so we looked at the, the, the three dramatically different users, the NJIT student, the, the prospective student, 
and the, and the visitor and alumni who are just there to kind of get up to speed with what's happening and all the cool new technology. So we wanted to make sure that each one of those visitors had a, had a, a, a different but similar experience. And, and if you, so if you can solve the circulation, you really, you really solve the building. One of the big challenges was how do you carve out a new front door into that high school where the, where the, the old monumental historic door is gone? So we, we gave them a new door facing the upper upland part of the campus, um, carving out some historic windows and putting in a new double height entry where you can enter up an amphitheater set of steps or go down below through an ADA ramp but basically end up kind of in the same place. We wanted that visitorship to be funneled into, into one exciting similar walkway. So the renderings here are evoking how, to, how the recycling can happen in, in the gym, the, the, the new classrooms along the very wide public corridors, so a lot of interaction can happen in those public corridors. Uh, keeping, you know, knocking off the plaster and exposing brick, putting in new steel to, to signify the, the, the the, new, the difference between the new and the old, so, so they're distinguishable. And then, of course, the labs that happen, how to make them light build and, and, and keep them uh, minimal and, and so that the activity becomes what's celebrated, not the architecture itself. So these are all the renderings that get um, documented then in these final construction photographs. The building just opened up this past spring. Um, so you can see the photograph of the upland side of the new front door uh, in the historic fabric, how that really draws you inside, whether you want to go up or you want to go down. Um, and the, the gym itself becomes a, a kind of a flex tech center, um, getting down from the upper level of that entry to the lower level, uh, tied together by two new carved out open spaces, one with a big beautiful steel stair in it, um, the classrooms off of the corridor, so you, you draw the natural light uh, into the public spaces and, and into the corridors. The labs, uh, clean and simple. Um, the uh, more, you know, carving out another double light space to, to encourage that, that the sense of it's not just one floor, but it's two floors that we, we want to engage the visitor in. Um, the, the flexible gym now becomes a kind of a library quiet hub for all sorts of different departments to collaborate and share that space. Um, and then I think one of my favorite places is in carving this area out, um, not wanting to drop ceilings, but wanting to expose all the systems, um, whether it's mechanical, structural, lighting, um, everything gets kind of its own characteristic with, with neutral colored paints, but nothing's hidden behind anything. Um, and, and when you carve out a, a concrete floor facing with a with a with a steel beam or 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 some kind of metallic uh, finish, and and then introducing a new corrugated metal onto the outside of the gym uh, where we didn't have glazing to kind of talk about the the <coughs> of, and the and the and the kind of strength of, of simple materials, um, and and I'll end with this sort of idea that that's developed in our own within our own teams, it's something that we call the subway aesthetic, where on the subway platform, everything is meant to be um, maintenance-free, it's exposed, it's durable and heavy duty, and often overlooked. You know, you take those spaces for granted so often, but when you start to slow down and look around those sub a subway platform, all of a sudden you, you realize that Design decisions were made, and they were made in very humble, simple ways, but, but that for us is, is a real inspiration for how we treat our spaces and, and, our, and, our, and our projects. So this is, again, back at the, a reference to the St. Anne's Warehouse. This is the, an image within the catwalks, right by the glass brick, um, with the mechanicals there and the lights there to support the theater program. But, that these spaces, whether they're back of house or front of house, when everything's exposed and everything is being sort of treated in an honest, minimal way, you know, you're kind of celebrating the city, you're celebrating infrastructure, and that theme that I started with earlier about, you know, being, how do we, we're not planting trees necessarily as architects, although we would like to and should, um, but we, our buildings get to, to act in that kind of response to 
to the city as an organism. And if we if we think of this, if we think about celebrating the systems within the building instead of putting them behind walls and ceilings, but actually letting them speak. Now, in a room like this, you've got this beautiful hung tracery and plaster on the ceiling and wood paneling. But we don't we don't live we don't build like this anymore. Um, and I think we in rethinking how we want to be living in the next hundred years. This is it's a it's a it's a vital time and, and it's a chance to reinvent ourselves. So I end with that thought and open it up for your discussions and questions. Yes, please. Yeah, um, this is all very inspiring, and I love the way you showed it for the students and how you approach. I was curious to ask uh, how acoustics are handled when all of these raw materials are used in this. Could be a fair amount of balance in some of these spaces. That's a really good question because we do a lot of work in the theater world, and and of all of the constraints which is a word I love because Peter Weisman taught me that you can, in, as an architect, particularly for students, you distinguish between the constraints of the project and the discretionary moves that you have as a designer. Acoustics are one of the great constraints of all time. And it's one of those unheralded constraints because you don't think about it, but um, in the theater world, you have to isolate the theater from the outside world because if you hear a fire engine go by, or a subway, or a horn honk, it ruins that magical connection you have to the, to the, to the, to the production that's happening. As an audience member, you need to have that special connection to, your, to, the, to the production and the program. So we do want to quiet spaces down. And the, the great thing about thinking, uh, in, in, as if you put acoustics first, you want to um, you want to put as many, you want to have a kind of a busyness. If you have a lot of flat walls, sound will bounce around, but if you can introduce even metal conduit on a, on a wall will defray and, 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 and spread a, a, a sound wave. Um, so we do, we do try to think about um, all of the opportunities to, to, first of all, not create noisy systems. So slowing down the, the mechanical system so you don't hear the whistle of the HVAC system. That's number one. Um, number two, using great, um, so if you can isolate the, the minimize the sound that's, that's being developed inside. So if there's a lot of chatter and a lot of, um, a lot of you know, if there's a cafe environment and there's 100 people all talking at the same time, then you do have to have sound absorbent materials, so you can do that with, we introduce a lot of plants in our spaces, they're wonderful for sound absorption, a lot of um, just fans to move, move around and, and sort of throw air, but also they help with a lot of distributing um, sound waves. If you can break up the sound waves, not create a lot of parallel surfaces, introduce some filigree, you're on your way. Thank you. More questions? Right here. Thank you. I think you should be commended for the, for the works that you're doing here with these, this reuse of buildings and some very nice examples. The question I have is, did you have to convince your clients to go in this direction or did they come to you and say we have this building and we want to refurbish this way? Uh, the, the, the relationship of the architect to the client is a dance. As we know, it's a very, it's a, it's a dip diplomatic, delicate dance. And we, every project we do is, is unto itself, separate from all the others. And I, I, we, over time, you start to see connections between the projects, but really they, each one, wants its own kind of DNA to, to evolve and, and to, to be true to itself, the project kind of dictates what it wants to be. And I think in, in all four instances, um, these, are, these are low budget projects, so we don't have a lot of money for covering up with finishes. And I think that, that because we love to play new and old, if we can peel off the plaster and expose a brick wall, 
that'll be one of the first things we do. Also, kind of it, it, in, in taking out the asbestos and taking out lead paint, you often mm -hmm. find yourselves removing a lot of old finishes and, um, and then keeping yourself from, from touching them is often the, the hard part. You know, leaving them and respecting them is, is the hard part. So, you know, you have to be very humble in, in, this, in, in, the, in this play of old and new to let, let the old have a strong voice. I think that's, that's a, a big part of, of this, this approach. But, they, but I would say that we're not really dictating necessarily. I think these, these designs evolve individually from the, from the project. Well, I think they're successful because they don't look like low budget projects to me. Um, you know, just that one project, especially with the, with the, the big steel frame, I was finding it disappointing that there was a Grumman building on Long Island out on 110 where they manufactured these uh, fire, fire planes for World War II. And that building sat there for a long time. I know I saw it myself. And you know, when you went into it, you just saw all this bird droppings all over the place. The windows had been uh, broken out. But what a nice opportunity for a project such as this. And the building was lost, unfortunately. I, 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 I love when, you know, when you, you walk around cities, you see the layers of how, if you think of the forest floor as having leaves and branches and trees all dropping and decomposing and kind of regenerating. Cities are like that too. And because so many cities are in places where, where, it's, where it's, it's ideal for human occupation, it, instead of lots of new cities sprouting up everywhere, we tend, cities tend to kind of be rebuilding on top of themselves over and over and over again. And I think there's nothing more exciting than allowing those layers of history to, to be all coexisting together so that you can, you can see the layers. And you get that in a European city all the time. American cities tend to kind of erase those, like the Grumman factories and stuff like that. We, you know, I think, so I think if we can, part of our role as architects, we're really the leaders in our communities in so many ways um, to, to be able to, to talk about what's important and, and to show how you can do it on a lower budget. Like the American Physical Society, we, we, we saved a lot in, in not having to, uh, by putting in some sprinklers, we didn't have to fireproof all, a lot of this stuff. And we could keep uh, the metal deck, which is supporting all the concrete, the Q deck, perforate the bottom of it, going back to the acoustics thing, uh, you can perforate Q deck and let, let it really be a, a sound absorber without introducing a lot of felt and fiberglass and other stuff like that. I think that's well said, and I think it's important because, especially in New York City, for people that, young people that are, are seeing that the old fabric disappear and seeing what, what I consider a lot of cheap looking buildings being constructed today, you know, doing what you're doing, maintaining at least a piece of this old building and incorporating modernism into it, it's very successful. Thank you. Hi there. Um, I had a question. What I found, I found the projects are interesting. They're really cool. But uh, when it comes to working with you know those historical sites and buildings, what's the biggest challenge? I, I think it, you could easily say that getting when it's in a historic district or a landmark, if it's a landmark you've got to get the Landmark Preservation Commission or SHPO on board with what you're trying to do. And uh, we've had success and not a lot of success with SHPO. For example, St. Anne's Warehouse, they, they wouldn't support it on a technicality. You can't, they, if they, you can't add a, another story to a two-story building and get SHPO support. So, so that was just not going to happen. As much as the SHPO technical team liked the project, we couldn't get SHPO to, to support it, and, and we couldn't take advantage of the six to eight million dollars that were that could have been available to the to the group for tax credits. Um, 
So that was disappointing, but they managed to raise the money from other other sources, so it was it was okay. Um, sometimes, uh, when you go to Landmark Preservation Commission in New York City, with, working in a historic district or an individual landmark, um, the uh, it's a I think it's a plus because the landmark team will often tell your client. You've got to really make this a great building. We're not going to let you cut corners, and so it does. It does force your client to take what you're doing more seriously, and I think that's a, that's a great, a, a great kind of leverage that architects can use, um, and and not be afraid of 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 of, a, of of opening up your design team to include the the staff members of of, of landmarks or SHPO to to get their support. I think that's it's really. It's, it's amazing that we have historic districts, and, and it's only relatively recently, since 1972, the first historic district in, in New York City. And that was the first in the country. Can you imagine like how that's 50 years ago? And so the, uh, his, the historic districts have, have, over time, outpaced the other districts. Sorry, I'm, I'm a tangent in here. But they've outpaced in terms of real estate values. They, they, it's been proven that historic districts hold value and grow in value. So I think that's a lesson. A lot of real estate landlords and, and that industry is afraid of being landmark because of the more bureaucracy and the permitting and stuff like that. But in the end, it's a better part of it. Better for the city, better for the design team because your client has to kind of maybe spend a little more money or think about this in a different way. Yes. Shippo wasn't even moved by the fact that you, it had once had three more stories. <laughs> but if you built the three more on top, then I think they would have been better. But, uh, but I have another question. Yes. I, I really appreciate the presentation, especially the diagrams of the different design strategies for each project. I hope these students were all looking carefully <laughs> at that, and particularly the, the alternate strategies for the uh, American Physical Society. But I have a, a non-architectural question. In the lab in the Brooklyn Navy Yard about the, the program and the client. I mean, how were those how were those startups subsidized? Who was the who was the driving force? So the, that? the the Navy it's a it's a classic public private partnership. The public part being the the Navy Yard is actually is is the Navy Yard property is owned by New York City, mm -hmm. and so they're and that's why they're using their million plus square feet to help subsidize and support startups uh, to give them lower rents than what you have to get outside in the, in the, in the marketplace. So the, the city and the state got together to provide some, some, fund, some grants and funding. And then being a technology hub, they were able to also get um, uh, universities to take on 8,000 square feet, so Cornell, Columbia, they've got, Cooper's got yeah. little spots there. They were able to, to get, and this is for, for you to, to go to, um, you know, a lot of resources were given for free, software, hardware, 3D printers, because they, every, all these tech companies wanted to have a presence in this kind of startup environment. And, and um, so it, 52 different tenants, all different shapes and sizes, and international as well, because you, the kind of the interdisciplinary nature was was something that made it very attractive for people to want to come and move in. Uh, but I think it, it was a, definitely a, a public money and private money and a lot of subsidies made it happen. And Matt, the, a group of two, two you very sort of broad, comprehensive-minded developers, David Belt and Scott Cummer, the brainchilds behind it. They just said, let's take one of these old warehouses and see what we can do with it. And they, they started this idea about 10 years ago. Just two guys. No, no, no real cash of their own. <coughs> yes? Jonathan, I also want to thank you for the presentation. It was phenomenal. I really appreciate it. I, I've done some historical work in the city as well. It's, it's pretty, I, I should do some work with Steiner Studios. So in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, pretty interesting. One question though, not all old architecture is good architecture. You don't have the classic shapes in there to work with. Have you ever had to tell a client, got to go a different direction? Knock it down. Do <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I, I, the, um, I think, 
we're, we're just had a, 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 it's ongoing right now, so I can't really talk about it. It's, uh, but, but there's a, an existing theater in, in New York City that's been a theater since 1920, and at 500 seats, now it's 290 seats, and it's, it got tons and tons of history. I mean, amazing productions have happened in there, but the building is not, as a theatrical space, can't really support new theater productions. And as much as I love to recycle, it's, it would be a real hardship for the theater producers and actors and the technical teams to have to, to work inside of a space that's, that's almost uh, 100 years old. And so in that situation... Um, it's going to be Starbucks? No, it's going to be a new, it's going to be a new theater, but, but they're going to have to spend $30 million to, and knock it down and start from scratch. So in that case, you romantically you'd like it to be something because then when you do see some of the new theaters that are going up in New York City, there's a few of them, like the Signature Theater in per the Pershing Square on West 42nd Street, the Playwrights Horizons, uh, also ver like a vertical series of theaters. There's not a lot of life in these new spaces. It's hard to bring the patina of the old uh, in in a new space, and I think that that the advantage of recycling something is that you have the built-in layering of stuff that, that you can work with and, and, and play off of. So even if it's not great architecture, it, old beams and, and any kind of, like you can recycle wood beams. I didn't show you, one of our larger projects is called uh, the One Hotel and Pier House in the Brooklyn Bridge Park, and they tore down these old warehouses to make space for this new hotel and condominium, very kind of a, a part of a public-private partnership to help support Brooklyn Bridge Park. And so we, we, we couldn't reuse any of the buildings. They were gone by the time we were brought on board. But we did say we want to use all the long-leaf yellow pine beams that came out, which they put into some storage. We want to reuse those as much as we can in the public spaces to give the feeling of something that was there once upon a time. Yes, sir. You didn't mention anything about the delivery method. And, and I'm curious, kind of like you just said, when, you, when you're in a space, you want to be able to bring up the patina of, of an old building and appreciate it for what's there. I'm wondering if you find that the traditional bid method is more restrictive than working with the construction manager, where you can be more explorative in the process and, and, and kind of dig in the building more without having to worry about getting a careful bid set put together? The, the problem with the, the, the character bid set is the best production your client has for all those changes in schedule and budget that can dramatically double the cost of the project. So we always try to overdraw and, and make and go overboard and try to tell the contractors what they're bidding on. And I think that with the new, with the, with, with BIM software, we, we're doing everything in Revit now that you can, you can quantify everything. So there, there's less guesswork for the contractors. They can take all your, your quantities right, off the, right out of the documents very easily. And so there's less guesswork now than there was in, in before you, when you just rolled out the plans and you have to measure everything with, with a scaling ruler. And so I think that the, there's a lot more competition and, and, and we're seeing low bids, a lot of low bids, which are kind of scary, because you know, okay, where, where, when are we going to get hit with those change orders? We're seeing a lot of very competitive low bids, but I think that's because people are seeing there's less hidden conditions and less places to, to pad it. In terms of achieving the aesthetic, like not knowing how a uh, slab might polish out or what's behind some plaster, yeah. not having an integrated partner like you see more often nowadays, I'm, I'm wondering if you find it limiting to know what your finished product is really going to be without being able to take those explorers. Well, there, I, I would say that that's a, you, you have to have a little bit of a leap of faith in this process when you want your concrete work, you know, to be to be what it is when they peel off the formwork. We don't have any money to finish it if it's not looking good. So you've got to have a leap of faith that that it will balance itself out in the, in the long run. A couple more questions from our students. 
Um, it's, it's not really a question, but uh, I don't know, your diagrams, like the way that you diagrammed the first building with the circulation the program was just like, I don't know, if it's, would you say that the way that you diagram and like break down space is completely like based off of things you learned from Peter Eisenman or because the way that yes. Professor Friedman, he also had uh, Eisenman and like the way that he, <laughs> the way that you know it, it's very similar to the way that he you know, breaks things down and like, you know, makes it simple. It's the starting point and you've yeah. heard people over and over again say if you, if you, you have to, you have to put your idea on this side, the space aside of a postage stamp. You ever hear that? Like you have to be able to make it the most simple yeah. diagram on a space the size of a postage stamp. So that your forces you to have the most minimal thing to represent your concept. In line work particularly. So, you know, the the this 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 project, by the way, I in, in an academic architectural environment, more studios around the country use this site as their as a studio project because you've got the rectangle and the triangle as geometry. You can't get better than that as a starting point. Um, and and so the, we really we felt the bar was raised really high here in particular. Um, to, to make something special and unique, and, and so we worked hard to, to make it legible in a, in a diagrammatic point of view. And, and, and yes, and, and I couldn't stress enough how to, even uh, this is a diagram, it's just more graphics and words, but it says the same thing, right? Simplify it, your, your thought making to a simple statement. So, yeah, these are, it's the best tool, and then models, by the way. After diagrams, models. We make hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of models, starting with the very simple to bigger. And, and you, the model is your best friend, studio and in practice, by far. We have another question over here. Um, in your office in San Juan, um, because I know Puerto Rico requires a different architectural approach because of the you know the geography of the warm climate you have um, tsunami phenomenons, you have um, hurricanes coming in. Um, do you need a different approach to green technology as you would see in those in New York? Fortunately, we don't need a different approach. Since the 50s, the construction documents and specifications in Puerto Rico have all been done in English for some strange reason. So everybody, all the architects that come out of the three really great architecture schools in Puerto Rico are all trained bilingually in Spanish and English with software that they get from, from the United States. And, and there is a, a completely seamless uh, discussion between the New York and the San Juan office. And, so the San Juan office is doing a lot of design work on New York projects with, because we can, we have a, also with video conferencing and, and talk about acoustics, we are, we're actually experimenting in our own spaces how to make the, the, the perfect acoustical space. The problem with, with, this, with, with video and mic conferencing is you hear a lot of echo and it's, it's awful. You know, it's, there's nothing worse than trying to say something and not be heard or, not hearing, not being part of the conversation. Like the Hamilton play, uh, you want to be at the table when the decisions are made. You know, so we have to make equal tables to, to make people really uh, have, a, have an equal voice, in the, in the, particularly in the design process. So we're working really hard to make it technologically seamless, but I think linguistically and culturally, we like the differences. We, we like the the fact that Puerto Ricans have a whole different environment in which they think about architecture because there's no, you don't, indoor or outdoor, just everything blurs in the tropics and, and that public spaces are celebrated much more in tropical architecture. So I think it's great to have Puerto Rican designers working on New York projects. It's a suburb of San, suburb of, New York is a suburb of San Juan, that's what we think. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question. 
Yes, sir. Uh, previously to your project, I had a very successful smorgasbord. Yes. And they had all types of open air food service, and I was very well received for several years. What happened to all of them, and did that create opposition to your project? They, uh, there was a lot of, there's opposition to everything we do. By the way, that's just, we work in the world of opposition because people generally don't like change. And communities are getting more and more organized and more aggressive in expressing their discontent. And in this case, there was a huge amount of opposition to filling in this, these open walls with a building, even if it was for a cultural community type of building like a theater. And um, in the, there were lawsuits and stopped the project for three years. Ultimately, it was settled and, and, and the lawsuits were, 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 were dismissed um, so the project could go ahead, but it was, it was not easy. And, and I think that um, the, the popular things like Smorgasburg or getting married in here or having a room to, to ride your bike or skateboard in um, or the, those, it, the, that was one reason why I wanted to keep the, the triangle open, to keep that feeling of, of this is a different kind of space. Because it's true when you have a, and you're in a city and you see a playground, that, that's, an, that's a great thing to have an open air playground. And you definitely don't want to see buildings go up on playgrounds. And, but I think, uh, I'll just quote one of the commissioners at Landmarks who said, um, New York City, doesn't need another ruin in its landmark portfolio. There already is one on Roosevelt Island. It's this old smallpox hospital by James Renwick. And it's a very expensive thing to maintain. A ruin is, it's not easy. And, and so the commissioner said, we don't need more ruins in New York City to maintain. Go ahead and put a roof over it and, and get going. <laughs> inspiring presentation and I'm impressed uh, really from the design sensitivity that is actually permeating all your work. You were talking about being humble in architecture where you are humble and sophisticated at the same time. And I think this is something that rarely you see. Uh, Part of this event is also the recognition of four of our students as the recipients of the 2017-2018 Friends Scholarships. And I would like to ask our scholarship committee members, we have two members tonight, to join me on stage and celebrate our students. Please, Laura Smyros, an associate at IQ Klingerman and Berkeley, and Guy Page, Vice President and Studio Director at H2M Architects and Engineer. I'm delighted to have you here tonight. Thank you. Thank you for your work. I know you are very busy people, so I really appreciate uh, your help and support to our students is a very important scholarship for us. Uh, supporting, of course, financially for of our best students. We have a great number of applications this year, so I know that you are spending a great amount of time going through the portfolios and selecting four of our best students. So. First, I would like to thank Dean, Maria, uh, and the faculty for aspiring students. Um, I said this year we received the highest number of applicants we have in uh, all the years we've been doing this. And it was a welcome, you know, for both myself, Guy Page, David Bush, and James Yankopoulos, who was also on the committee for selecting the winners. Um, it helped us to feel more connected to the student scene, you know, as many portfolios and presentations that were put forward. So it was, it was quite a welcome, thank you. Um, I only wish, uh, you know, so we'll be awarding four scholarships tonight, $2,500, and I only wish that 
Uh, like when we were students, we could give an award to everybody. <laughs> I know that's how it was when my kids were young. Um, Guy, do you want to get uh, your award first? Well, thank you very much. Um, this is an honor for me to, uh, to get this one award out. Um, this award was established about six years ago. Um, it's, the, it's considered the Ed Fulford Memorial Scholarship Award. Um, it's on behalf of a student that was an architectural student here, uh, pursuing his five-year degree. Um, was also interning at my firm uh, about six years ago when he tragically was, uh, when he passed away. Um, so with the Friends group, we, we came together and we initially were giving three scholarships out and uh, our firm had felt that we really wanted to recognize Ed, Eddie, Eddie as I would know him. I got to know him a little bit as a student um, sitting on one, on one of his critiques uh, one time uh, as a guest critic here at the college. Um, so this is uh, H2O's way of uh, sponsoring the scholarship uh, in addition to the other three scholarships that the French group is sponsoring this evening. Um, a little bit about Eddie, he was a, it was a really loved architecture, uh, very involved in his community. Uh, he played uh, hockey, he was a team captain on his hockey team. Uh, a tremendous amount of uh, community involvement, was a volunteer fireman. Um, so the opportunity for me to be able to give a scholarship in his name each year going forward uh, was trying to recognize a student that was similar to Eddie and the way they live their life and, and reviewing the scholarship uh, applications. Uh, with that, um, this student was also, he's, he's maintaining, I think, a 3.85 average uh, going into his fifth year. Uh, very involved in the community. Um, uh, his submission, his essay, as well as the, the projects that he presented. Um, amazing work uh, from a student at, uh, going into that fifth year here at uh, MIRT. Um, so with that, I'd really like to recognize uh, um, Stephen Skolko. If you can come up and present. Uh,
sweet treats for you next door for the students but also for our guests. Thank you everybody for the beautiful and wonderful day.